Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 11th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can we just make sure that our mobile phones are put onto silent, please? Uh, the first item on our agenda this morning is to decide whether to take items 6 and 7 in private. Are members agreed? agreed. Thank you. We're agreed to that. The second item on our agenda is to consider a Scottish statutory instrument which seeks to amend the 2017 Budget Act. Before we come to the motion seeking our approval at Agenda Item 3, we'll have an evidence taken session on the order. And I welcome to the meeting the Act Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution. Mr Mackay is joined for this item by Scott Mackay, who is the Head of Finance Coordination in the Scottish Government. I welcome both our witnesses to the meeting and I invite the Cabinet Secretary, if he wishes, to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. The Spring Budget Revision provides the final opportunity to formally amend the Scottish Budget for 2017-18. This year's Spring Budget Revision deals with four different types of amendments to the Budget. Firstly, a few funding changes. Secondly, a number of technical adjustments that have no impact on spending power. Thirdly, some Whitehall transfers, and finally, some budget neutral transfers of resources between portfolio budgets, including a modest budget redirection to ensure we maximise our available budget. The net impact of all of these changes is an increase in the approved budget of £421.4 million. Table 1.1 on page 5 of the supporting document shows the approved budgets following the autumn budget revision and the changes sought in the spring budget revision. The supporting document to the Spring Budget Revision and the brief guide prepared by my officials provide background on the net changes. The first set of changes increased the budget by £141.7 million and comprises of changes which have been allocated over a number of lines as detailed in the brief guide. The second set of changes comprise a number of technical adjustments to the budget. The technical adjustments are mainly non-cash and therefore budget neutral and have a net positive impact of £271.9 million on the overall aggregate position. It is necessary to reflect these adjustments to ensure the budget is consistent, uh, consistent with the accounting requirements and the final outturn that will be reported in our annual accounts. And with regard to Whitehall transfers and allocations from HM Treasury, there is a net positive impact on the budget from a number of small transfers of £7.8 million. The final part of the budget revision concerns the transfer of funds within and between portfolios to better align the budgets with profiled spend. The main transfers between portfolios are noted in the SBR, supporting document and the guide to the SBR. As we approach the financial year end, we will continue in line with our normal practice to monitor forecast outturn against budget and wherever possible we will seek to utilise any emerging underspends to ensure we make optimum use of the resources available in 2017-18 and manage the necessary carry forward to meet the additional spending commitments for 18-19 as I disclosed at stage one of the Budget Bill for 2018-19. Uh, the additional £34.5 million of funding for local government announced at stage one does not appear in the spring budget revision due to the timing issues, but did appear in the local government finance order and will appear in the outturn statement. In line with the recommendations of the budget process review groups, uh, recommendations, my officials have included in the brief guide sent to the committee an indication of the forecast outturn position at 31st of December that informed the spring budget revision. The brief guide to spring budget revision prepared by my official sets out the background to and the details of the main changes proposed, and I hope that colleagues have found this guide helpful. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. On, on page four of the spice briefing notes provided to the committee, um, it explains there's an underspend totalling £29 million, which has been surrendered from the More Homes housing budget. Can you please explain the reason for that? What impact, if any, it will have on the government's efforts to improve housing supply in Scotland, thanks. It's, a, it's not a lack of spending on housing commitments. It's more around, the, in terms of more homes, the, um, a, those who are selling properties, the transactions coming back to us. That might have been through, for example, a financial transactions. So where there's been the, the open market or the um, help to buy. So where, ahead of forecast, people have been selling it, the government gets the share of that, and therefore it's supplemented income, so there's no detrimental impact on our budgets. So effectively, what you're saying is that that £29 million is, would, is money that's over and above the allocated amount in well, the budget price. Essentially, yes, just because the properties have been sold and we get okay. the share back in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, James Kelly? 
you can read it. I mean, I do have a concern in this area. I note the Cabinet Secretary's explanation. I see in the notes that it relates to, to more homes, you know, which would seem to indicate to me that it's about supporting uh, housing supply. Um, this is the second year that this has happened. Last year, there was an underspend of £21.5 um, on housing, and uh, this year we, we find it's £29 million. And the scale of the challenges in relation to housing, where there are thousands on waiting lists, we have people rough sleeping, I think it's a real concern that, there, that there's an underspend there. Can I maybe try again, Kavina? I would understand that conclusion if the perception was that we weren't spending on housing. If I can put it another way, it's extra income from more people than we had anticipated selling their home and the government getting back essentially the share of the investment we put in through those financial schemes. So it's not that we're not spending enough on housing, it's extra income unforeseen above what we had anticipated that then forms essentially as an underspend. And on the wider subject uh, of uh, housing, uh, this of all years, of course, is the a, a substantial uplift in funding for affordable homes, for investment in new housing, for um, homeless support as well, part of the £10 million for the uh, ending homelessness uh, together fund. So I'd want to reassure Mr Kelly that it's not an underspend on housing. We're investing massively. We're doing more on capital. And there's that revenue support for, for housing specifically. But this is a very particular issue around essentially those transactions generating more income than was forecast, because you can't absolutely um, forecast uh, the properties that will be sold and our share of a return on that. So if there's, if there's more money coming into the pot, you know, why is it? Well, let me, let me uh, look at it from another angle. In terms of the £29 million, where has that then been allocated to? Well, that's also in all your papers. You can see where the extra resources are allocated to and where the uh, underspends are identified are. That's my point no. about the overall spring uh, budget revision, no. that that is the allocation of those uh, resources. But there's not a direct read-over from the £29 million. Surely, you, you must know yourself, as a constituency MSP, the scale of the, the crisis in housing. If you had an extra £29 million, why was it not allocated to housing? Uh, because we've just approved a budget that takes the level of capital investment to over £700 million to meet the target of 50,000 affordable homes, of which we're perfectly on track. Having completed the last target of 30,000, we're on track to deliver 50,000. We're also delivering a new fund to tackle homelessness, and we're supporting local authorities. So I, I would argue that there is um, adequate resources in the housing portfolio. If, if this was a separate issue of you know, not being able to spend money on housing, I would get the charge against us that we should be doing more. This is about um, that additional um, revenue. And the, the answer to, well, where has it been spent? Well, in the rest of the document, which is perfectly clear well, on where the, the budget revisions are. Well, as I say, I didn't, I didn't see a direct read over and I think the point is still relevant, that the scale of the challenge means that if you had any extra money, it should have been spent on housing. I mean, even the, the I newspaper notes this morning that a fifth of people in Scotland with disabilities uh, are living in homes that are not fit for purpose. You know, some people aren't able to, to wash themselves in the homes that they live in. You know, that's, that's just one example of the, the, the crisis that we're facing. And I would certainly argue that if you had extra money, it should have been allocated to housing. It can be an understand the point, and it's a fair point. To make. However, even in Labour's alternative budget as presented in Parliament, it didn't ask me to do any such thing. It certainly laid out other budget priorities, but I'm afraid it wasn't more money for housing. So what's been argued today is a shift from the previously presented uh, position in relation to the Labour budget. But you know, I'm satisfied that, that the, these revisions do represent priorities, and it certainly would not raise any concern that there's a lack of a, uh, ability to spend money on housing. Can I have this discussion from and understand the reason that James is asking it from the political to technical, because it seems to me that whilst I called it an underspend in my additional question to you, there's actually a technical quirk in how we describe this. And is there a better way that, we, that in future buds that this could be described? Because whilst it's appropriate for James to ask the questions about whether, if there's additional monies, where, could, where, where should they be spent? Why is this being called an underspend? Because it's not really an underspend. It's not an it's budget variation, I suppose, is the point from the published budget. So it's a variation from the published budget. 
uh, to make the point that what we what we support, what we approve as a parliament, aligns with what's actually happening. And therefore, you're right, convener, if there's more income, then that's a different kind of variation to an underspend. So is it just about how we describe this in future so that yeah. people are a bit more clear? It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't take point. away necessarily from the point James makes, but I think it would help for the technical understanding okay. of it either. Yeah. Thanks, convener. And, and just following up on that, two short points. The first one, it, it would therefore be true to say that the fact you've got that £29 million pounds is um, a symptom of the fact that the government policy has been more successful than you anticipated it would be? It depends on your view on buying and selling uh, houses, but arguably, yes, if you think okay. it's a good thing that the, 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 the financial support has allowed people to purchase properties, has allowed people to sell them on, and government gets a share of that, a percentage share, slightly mm -hmm. different from the English scheme, of course. Mm -hmm. but, but yes, you could view that as success. Okay, yes. Thank you. And the second point was, is it also true to say that if, uh, as James Kelly suggests, you were to take that £29 million and spend it on housing, you would have to reduce spending elsewhere in the budget? Yes, if you were right. to hypothecate an issue like that, that would be the outcome potentially. But the point I'm making is... This whole revision is the Parliament reallocating resources, essentially. That's what we're doing. But we wouldn't ordinarily say, unless you just confine spending within each line, um, as being as rigid as that. The point of this is to make those transfers. So, again, I understand the point, but we've made budget choices, which is uh, massively in favour of housing, particularly uh, on that capital investment. Um, which is a choice that we've made. But that's the nature of the underspend. I mean, convener, we'll reflect uh, further on how the, um, even the brief guide might could, could further draw that out. But with the quantity and quantum of revisions to explain each one would be a bit much. But I think for maybe the more significant quantum, maybe that would be more helpful. So I can give further thought to how we describe that. Alexander, you've got a supplementary on this? Uh, very quick supplementary. Uh, this is now the second year it's unforeseen. Uh, for, a, for a relatively similar amount, will it be unforeseen next year as well? Well, it probably would, but, you know, <laughs> I think I, I've been a party to this committee where you have described collectively as a committee is the one thing you know about economic forecasters is they'll all get it wrong. They can't get it absolutely right. I wish they could. It would resolve a number of uh, uh, issues, uh, variables. But... Um, Unless we had a crystal ball on exactly what happens in the housing market, yes, it's hard to get it exactly right. Um, so we don't know. And we also, it's, it's actually, it's a good thing the way that the scheme's designed in terms of a percentage share, because it means, you know, if the property market's growing, um, if, if, if that's more buoyant than the government, then therefore the taxpayer benefits from that investment as well. So it is just hard to predict. As you know, OBR would say in relation to transaction taxes, and I would say the same in terms of our transaction taxes. And for all those reasons, it is hard to predict. It's better, at least it's in the more positive territory than negative. Thank you. Neil? Yeah. Just, I, I agree with the points about the, um, the, what's been said about the definition of underspend surrendered more homes um, and the £29 million allocated next to it. Um, Obviously, as James Kelly said, that £29 million could have been spent on, on housing. How many more homes would you have been able to build with that £29 million? Well, <laughs> that, that's hard to quantify, especially because the, it's the capital investment that makes the difference on building homes. It's the capital investment that's over £700 million. Um, you know, arguably, which of the budget revisions does that would, would members not support is the interesting question. Is it, is it health? Is it... You know, I was just asking, how many, how many well, more I'd, homes I'd, could you have got for £29 million? Pounds? If you would like me to cost yeah. such a um, proposition, I will, but I don't know off the top of my head. That wouldn't surprise you, um, Mr. Billy. You, you, I take it from that you didn't consider spending the £29 million pounds on, I have, on more homes in that case? Okay, look, I've considered that spending over £700 million, pounds, presenting that to Parliament to help build 50,000 new affordable homes, surpasses targets and um, working in partnership take it with... As a no. I'm not, well, can I tell you, I'm, I'm not downplaying the importance of housing, but I actually think the government making a priority of capital investment, housing's quite a significant investment, and that should be welcomed. So did, did I think that we need the other uh, amount from this transaction to meet our target? No, I don't. I think the uh, direction of travel, 
will meet our commitment and the community secretary um, believes in that as well. It will require further capital investment year on year. So there is a plan. Um, and I mean, I have to say in relation to the cost per unit, it is something I want to keep a close scrutiny of. And in terms of how it impacts on land supply and all these other matters as well is, is significant. So I'm afraid it is a bit more complex and how many more houses can 29 million pounds get you? Because there's a lot in this land supply, a uh, planning. Um, cost of delivery in units and where they are in the country and how it's distributed and, and which um, which uh, local authorities and housing associations can do what with it. So the revenue uh, planning assumption that be given to local authorities and on a multi-year basis is what's given me confidence that no, I don't need the extra amount from this. You could describe it as over recovery if you so wished. There's, a, there's obviously a lead time associated with the capital programme as well. So. So stepping that up in, in the short term is not straightforward, and that larger programme remains fully for funded going forward. OK, I, I thought we'd got to the end of housing, but I think Ivan's got another supplementary. Yeah. I mean, given that we've established, Cabinet Secretary, this isn't money that's sat in a shoebox somewhere, it's already been allocated to another budget line. If you're going to go through the exercise of working out how many houses this is going to provide, can you also go through the, the, the exercise of calculating how many fewer nurses or how many fewer teachers you'd be able to employ if you had to reallocate that money from another budget headline into housing? Well, this is one of the most exciting debates I've had at a spring budget revision. <laughs> but yes, you would equally, just in the terms of the budget process overall, pick out what you wouldn't want to do in the rest of this, correct? Well, let's move on to other areas, please. Neil, you had another area you wanted to raise? Yes. Um, it was in relation to Whitehall transfers and specifically the £1.1 million pounds of Whitehall transfer in relation to the tampon tax. Um, I just wanted to ask what... Um, what women's organisations will benefit from this cash and, and what goals will you set for the use of that £1.1 million pounds transfer? Um, I mean, I... I'm not sure I have the breakdown here. But, but, so you've got to come back to us. Yes. Um, that would be and, helpful. Yeah, you. and I'm not entirely sure if... And I want to check this, if that element... Because nor, ordinarily it's not um, hypothecated or ring-fenced. So I would want to, to check that out. And obviously we've got our own initiatives around this. Um, so I just want to check mm -hmm. the line of sight between that and what yeah. we are doing. So yeah, I'll do that in writing. That would be helpful. Yeah. Thank thank you. A substantial sum of money. Right. Thank you. Alexander, you had another qu question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, it's on the economy, jobs and fair way work uh, section. And can I just note my register of interest relating to renewables. Um, uh, it says there's a, uh, 8 million going to Wave Energy Scotland. I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could provide a bit more clarity about what that is. Is that to their total budget uh, and what is he expecting for that? Okay, uh, in terms of the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has been a previously not necessarily the progress in the past on wave energy. Um, so my understanding from that portfolio is that it is the development of the um, technology in the northwest coast of Scotland to support that exploration, that, those jobs, that um, side of it, and it's to um, assist with the manufacturing of wave uh, devices. Now, if, if a member wants more on the specific details of the projects, I can provide that through the Economy Secretary. Um, but it's essentially within that portfolio to support wave technology, which has not been delivered to our aspirations in the past. Thank you. Mordo. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, two two um, uh, items I just want to ask about. Um, first is, the, in the funding increases in learning, there's £16 million going into SQA resource pressure. Can you give a little bit more detail as to what that's for? Can I ask Scott Mackay to cover yeah, this yeah. element? Um, it's essentially covering the costs of additional funding requirements on the um, national qualifications and curriculum for excellence and changes being made to the assessment processes to ease teacher workload. Right, and is this expected to just be a one-off or would, would, would these pressures not be seen to be something that would be ongoing into the future? Uh, I, I suspect that there will be ongoing pressures, to be honest. Um, Mr Fraser, the Right across the public sector, I've been trying to ensure that we are efficient and we are driving down costs and you're not compromising on quality. Um, 
but I suspect there will be ongoing pressure there. Now, the question then for government is whether we increase budgets as a response um, as a matter, of course, over the, the budget. Yeah. Okay. Rather than see it as a pressure that I'm then responding to mid-year. OK, thank you. That's helpful. And the other one was th there's a £50 million financial transaction against Bifab, which we know is the, the offered loan support to that company. Um, do you know, as of now, how much of that has been drawn down? Um, I don't have an update. And could I um, say that uh, this might be a matter that the committee will want more on? sooner rather than later, but it's currently quite sensitive. But I think the committee would appreciate further information sooner rather than later. I think there are live um, discussions. So I think that's a, a, a very important area to touch upon is fluid, and I think you will want to return to it. OK. Thank you. Emma? Thank you, convener. Um, this might be a wee bit of a tangent as well, but um, I'm aware that this is the spring budget revisions, and. Uh, when I looked at the papers, it said it, that under the internal transfer section, it states that there's a transfer of 5.3 million from economy, jobs and fair work portfolio to rural economy and connectivity to assist funding for Highlands and Islands enterprise capital projects. And so this might be my wee bit of a tangent here, but since we are having an exciting spring budget revision today. Um, I'm interested in the South Scotland Enterprise Agency, and uh, which is our equivalent to the Highlands and Islands Agency for the South, about capital investment potential for roads and rail infrastructure. Would that be a consideration in future budgets? And what portfolios would that be impacting on then? It would, it, it, sorry, convener. It would largely come from the, um, the economy brief. Um, but also um, uh, Fergus Ewing, in terms of connectivity, w would have a role as well. So um, you will probably see both portfolios take an interest in it because of connectivity, um, as well as Keith Brown's portfolio in uh, economy. So there will be, I'd imagine, there will be continue to be transfers um, in future, even when the new body is established. OK, thank you. I think it's just important from my knowledge because there's a lot of local issues around the 75, 76 and 77 at the moment, so that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. A okay. little on connectivity, Willie. Yeah, thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, there's just a small item on the rural economy and connectivity. Heading there, I see two transfers um, taking place, uh, one of £5 million to, the, to support the EU Futures IT programme. And there's another smaller one there, but £700,000 to support the events at, uh, with the screens at Hamden Park. I wonder if you have any details of the, both of those, just, well, particularly the Futures IT programme and what that £5 million is doing for Can us. Can I just check on uh, the budget revision, which paper, it's, which page uh, you're on? Page, it's page 74. Okay. Spice paper refers yeah. to them, and it's in the budget page at uh, page 74. Okay, I think I'll have to follow up on that one. I, mean, I don't have any further information on that yeah. particular line. Okay. Right. Yeah. okay. Uh, the second one, though, you said, so that was Futures IT. What was the second one? Uh, Sorry. The second one was a transfer to support events uh, through the big screen developments at Hamden Park. It's about £700,000. I just wonder about the background to that. Is, um, you know. and do you have the... Budget it's, revision page. It's also in page 74. Right, okay. Do I would. <laughs> that as well. Yeah. That's down that to quite a fine seven, level of detail. 74. That's it. Right. I'm, a, I'm accepting you're coming back to us in that convener. Um, convener? Cabinet <laughs> Secretary? Yeah, I just wanted to check both. They're not on the same page. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> on 74, your specific inquiry on the £700,000 yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, to fund the purchase of giant screens yes, at Hampton Park in support of UEFA's Euro 2020. Oh, right. I, I'm not an expert, but I would suggest that that is to fund the purchase of giant screens at Hampton <laughs> Park in support of UEFA Euro 2020. Um, that's what it's for. Right. It's a bigger screen TV, I appreciate, than you'll get in the average household, but it is for these big events. For there, are, there are big screens at Hamden, that's what I was wondering. There are screens there already. 
I'm, I'm, I'm hearing Mr Coffey saying there are screens there already. I right, can tell you, I, I wasn't preparing for that line in the budget revision. Um, again, if you require further information, I can happily get uh, the portfolio to provide okay, it for you. Can I just say no? Thank you. And move to James okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's convenient. Let's hope, Scotland, let's hope Scotland play better on these uh, bigger screens that we're getting installed. Um, it's a technical question uh, in relation to the Whitehall. Cool. <laughs> 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 Would I ever? Um, the, in relation to the Whitehall transfer section, yeah. there's uh, an amount in relation to teachers' pensions of £47 million. I was just looking for some background on that. Okay, um, I'll ask Scott <coughs> McCarry to come on that. That one. Teachers' pensions. Teachers' pensions. Um, I think that's. It. I'm actually looking at the spice table on that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's under Whitehall transfers. It's yep. under the technical changes section. Yep. Is it page yeah. It's the page 98. Page 98. Thanks. It is. An AME, so it's, a, it's an AME expenditure. Yeah, it's it's um, an adjustment to bring the, the pensions in into line with the latest forecasts, and we draw down the funding, the the budget cover from um, HM Treasury as part of an annual AME budget process. I was um, just wondering, if could, maybe could you write to the committee as you're doing the other stuff, just to get some additional yeah. information yeah. on that? Obviously. Um, University lectures pensions is a, a big issue, and I'm just interested as to why why such a large amount of £47 million. Yes. Pounds. I'm not trying to make any no. political yeah. point, I'm just interested in the background. Okay, you'll, you'll come back to us, Cabinet Secretary. We'll move on. But, but it's just because we're not seeing any difference other than the normal state of affairs where there is the forecast that's drawn down from uh, Amy and it's covered through those transfers. Yeah. So no variation. So this is NHS the and teachers' pension, Amy. It's due to changes in indexation and equalisation work carried out by Treasury. So it's a technical adjustment to the there to the go. forecast. That right. um, that's all he needs. That's fine. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? No other questions. We now move to agenda item three, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I invite the cabinet secretary to move S five M. 10915 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Budget Scotland Act 2017 Amendment Regulations 2018 Draft be approved. I move. Members have any other comments? I put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S5M10915 be agreed to or well agreed? We are agreed. The next item on agenda is to consider a statutory instrument which seeks to revise the landfill tax rates and bans for 2018-19. And we're just about to change officials while I'm doing this, so we'll just continue. I'm not going to stop. Before we come to the motion seeking our approval at agenda item 5, we'll have an evidence session on the order. Again, we are joined for this session by the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution. Mr Mackay is joined for this item by David Carucci, um, Policy Advisor at the Scottish Government. Um, and, I, and obviously, as, as I just wonder if there's any statement you'd like to make at this stage, Cabinet Secretary? Very briefly on this technical matter, uh, convener. Uh, the Scottish Landfill Tax uh, Standard Rate and Lower Rate Order 2018 specifies the standard rate and lower rate for Scottish Landfill Tax as set out in the draft budget. These proposed rates ensure that the tax increases are in line with inflation and matches the planned UK landfill tax rates for 2018-19, as provided in the Finance Act 2016. In setting these rates, I'm acting to avoid any potential waste tourism through material differences between the tax rates north and south of the border. In addition, I'm providing appropriate financial incentives to support the delivery of our ambitious waste and circular economy targets, including zero waste goal, that no more than 5% of the total waste should go to landfill by 2025. Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts that we will generate revenue of £106 million from Scottish landfill tax in 2018-19.
I've just got one question I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary. I recognise, obviously, the order's proposals to match the UK landfill tax rates intended to minimise potential risk from um, waste tourism. And I just wonder, though, if the, Scottish, if the UK government were to change its rates at short notice, how are you able to respond to that, and how would you seek to react if that was to happen? I suppose we'd give it consideration whether we consult or not would be um, up to government, but I would need to return with a further statutory instrument if I was to propose a change. Um, I don't think it's been the norm for the UK government to change this out of sync, so I would expect that continuity to continue. Okay. Any other questions? Alexander? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, whilst we're obviously supportive of the aims of, of landfill tax and what it's trying to achieve, one of the unfortunate consequences is yeah, increase of fly tipping. Uh, and I was wondering uh, if the Cabinet Secretary's got anything to uh, um, add to whether the increased revenue that will come from this uh, will be going to those who have to deal with it, which is mainly councils. We don't hypothecate it. One positive element is the um, credit that we give around the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund, which is actually slightly more generous than the um, rest of the, the, the UK equivalent. And, and that rate will continue to be higher. But we don't hypothecate it, it, cont it contributes to the overall budget and of course we are doing more around um, environmental action, zero waste, support to local government and those wider objectives. So it's not a hypothecated tax, but I would argue that the range of other event interventions we make, yeah, is, ha is, 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 is in part funded and supported by the landfill tax. Okay. Okay, any other questions? There have been no other questions. We now move to agenda item five, which is consideration of the motion and the order. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to remove motion S5M10850 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Scottish Landfill Tax Standard Rate and Low Rate Order 2018 be approved. Um, you moved. Want to moved. Okay. Um, the question, therefore, is that motion S5M10850 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, the committee will now publish a short report to the Parliament in the coming days setting out our decision on both orders. And as agreed at the start meeting, we will take the next two items in private. And at this stage, like the, the Cabinet Secretary's and officials for their attendance, I now close the public part of this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>